Okay. Um, so we'll um, get started. Just wanted to know if there are any clarifications, any any questions um, based on what we've uh, been learning so far. Any questions at all? Okay, none whatsoever. Okay, you can feel free to ask uh, later also. I can make a note of it and you can put it on the chat, right? Okay. Okay, let me... Um... So I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, if you can feel free to ask. Uh, you know, you don't have to say, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like one doubting person or, you know, questions are absolutely fine. And it's better that you clarify it. Like, uh, for example, you might believe a little differently uh, about these things. Uh, and uh, like, you know, if, if it is so, you can you can share you know, and, uh, you know, and give your reasons for that. And, um, and you know, we'll be able to uh, look at the word of God together and see you know, why we are. Uh, you know, uh, teaching this and um, and what does the word of God say? So, um, you know, that is always scriptures always are uh, a reference point, right? So we can we'll always go back to that and and check that out. Okay, so so you can feel free to um, ask. Okay, okay. Um, let me continue. Yeah, uh, Divya, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes, Pastor. Uh, yeah. One, one is like, um, uh, if there are no uh, scenarios, right, where we you know, operate on these gifts, like in a practical sense, uh, how mm. can a person know like what gifts they have? And mm. so is are these gifts uh, linked to your natural ab abilities? Like some people will be good at you know uh, naturally good at things like maybe mm -hmm. a teaching or an analysis or things like that, or root cause you know mm -hmm. in such cases is the gifts given by the holy spirit linked to the natural abilities of a person uh -huh. um, like the first part is like you said uh what if there are no scenarios to um move in the gifts I, I didn't understand that can you just clarify that yeah, first yeah yeah pastor like if there is uh uh not an avenue where these gifts can be exercised so hmm. how how can um, you yeah. well okay okay the 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 thing is okay maybe if you're in isolation you know you don't come in contact with another person um uh, but actually when i think of it uh, you know, let's say you wishing, for example, you know, you want to wish somebody a very happy birthday, okay, friend, family, uh, whatever, and you just wait on the Lord and ask, ask the Lord, okay, God, give me a word for this person, right? Um, what is it that this person really needs, and uh, and then and then the Lord speaks to you a specific thing, and then you share that, um, and yeah, so this the, uh, the avenues are limitless, actually. So that is what I would say. Um, but yeah, the second part of the thing is, okay, what if you have certain natural abilities? Okay, maybe you're analytical, you're creative, you're imaginative and all that. And um, but like we uh, uh, saw you know, right at the beginning, we see that these are not naturally learned abilities. Okay, so these are um, uh, like imparted by the spirit, the very word spiritual gifts, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. I do not want to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. This, that word pneumaticos is what he says, you know, these are, these are things of the spirit and not of the flesh. Right? So it's not naturally learned. It's not uh, uh, learned uh, in, in any other manner. So these are given by the spirit and it's a gift. So, uh, so will uh, my natural abilities come into play? Okay, uh, so that is something that uh, well, yeah. If you, if you, let's say if you uh, renewed your mind to be a person of faith, you know, you your understanding of the word, you know, you you've learned, you've studied, and uh, well, the, that would definitely help the gift, right? You know, uh, let's say in knowing where things are and um, having a background for uh, you know, for the gift, for the reference point for the gift, you know, is it of God, etc. So that will definitely 
you know, you know, be helpful. But the gift per se is of the spirit. The origin and the, the source is the spirit of God. It's not something that is um, naturally uh, uh, developed. You know, it's not something that you're you know, naturally born with. It's uh, it's something that is given by the spirit. And like our natural abilities, these gifts also will, you know, we can sharpen and grow in it. Uh, and it comes with with the use. Right? So that's uh, that's something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, okay. Pastor. Yeah. Uh, for the first question, what I meant was uh, uh, like uh, just as you were sharing, right? Um, for mm-hmm. you, uh, there was... Uh, um, uh, like you got an opportunity where you know you could minister to certain people. Mm. I was just asking in the base on the basis of you know um, a church setting or things like that. Oh, I see. Yeah, that is just one uh, you know one environment in which you get to minister. But actually, if you look at it, uh, uh, the options are limitless, really. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. For- Fine, fine. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Priya's question. Uh, Priya, there's no wrong question, so don't worry. Uh, the question is, um, how do I know how God sees me? Okay, yeah, that's a that, that's a, that's a very valid question. Okay, so how do we know how God sees us? Okay, so we uh, we go back to the Word of God. We read the Word of God. We understand from the Word of God, um, and this is how God sees me okay so for example you know god's great love for you uh, so god uh, let's say you read john 3 16 okay john 3 16 says uh, god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so that verse says for god so loved the world okay now, so you and i uh, and you are part of that world and so god so god loved you that he gave his only begotten son that you may not perish okay. so so you know that okay when he looks at me uh, he 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 you know th- this is this is the greatest sacrifice like he uh, that he gave his only begotten son for me and uh, so that i will not perish that i will spend i will you know spend time with him in eternity um, but i that i should have everlasting life so you see that okay god actually loves me Okay, so so we look at scripture and we see um, so we as we read through we see that this is how God deals with people. This is how God deals with me, and particularly, you know, you you are a believer. You've come to know Christ. You've come to you know, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So there are plenty of verses, and that is uh, I think you are learning that in, in the in Christ course if you've. If you signed up for it, um, so there are plenty of scripture which talk about the born again person. Okay, so the born again person is in Christ, right? Is is one spirit with him, with him. Uh, so you know, plenty of scriptures which talk about that, and uh, you know, maybe a couple of those would be you, know, you go to Second Corinthians and uh, uh, chapter five. Um, okay, five and verse seventeen says, "Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, okay, so that's talking about you, um, who's a believer, he is a new creation." Okay, so it says that you are a new creation; you are created newly in Christ. All things have passed away because all, behold, all things have become new. So he's looking at you as a new creation. He's not looking, considering your old self, you know, uh, your. The, your life that you lived before you came to Christ, all that is taken away in Christ, you've become a new creation. So because the old is gone, all things have become new. You go further down to the verse, uh, verse 21, uh, uh, verse, or verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Again, he's talking about the born-again believer. We are ambassadors for Christ. Who's an ambassador? A representative of a nation, a spokesperson for a nation. So this is how God sees me. 
because I am a believer, I am in Christ, I am a representative, I'm an ambassador for Christ. So wherever I go, I, you know, I speak on behalf of my king, on behalf of, you know, the one who, uh, one who sent me. So uh, on behalf of the kingdom of God, I'm an ambassador for Christ. Uh, verse 21, for he knew him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is what has happened in Christ, that I've become the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteousness is the character nature of God. Uh, so not only do I have right standing with him, but this is what God sees me as, right? He sees me as having his righteousness because of the blood of Jesus. So he made him who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So, so these are ways to... So you know that, okay, this is how he sees me. He sees me as someone who's righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Right? So he sees me, he sees me, as, he, he sees me with eyes of love. He sees me as a person who is uh, not condemned, but as a new creation. Okay, so, so what do I do? So I, I take this and whenever I have these thoughts, when I look at my mirror, when I look at the mirror and then I, I you know, thoughts come, oh, you know, look at you. Uh, you know, you're ugly. No, I'm not. I'm a new creation. Right? Uh, Ephesians 2 talks about how I'm a workmanship. That word used there is, a, uh, I think it's Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 9. Um, okay, we'll just quickly go through. Uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship. Okay, so that workmanship, that word there is a Greek word, poema, uh, which means a work of art like a painting, a beautiful painting or a sculpture, or, you know, it's a work of art. So it says here, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I'm reading Ephesians 2 verse 10. Um, for work prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So which means that his workmanship, his work of art, right? So when uh, God, you know, he sees me as his work of art. So... And then, so so, what do I do in response? I, I accept that, I receive that. And that truth, you know, is something that rises above all the other, you know, all the other voices. Okay, maybe people are saying, you are, you know, you're good for nothing, you are useless, you are a failure. No, this is how God sees me, right? So, um, so that should enable us to walk from that place, to live out a life, uh, a victorious life in Christ. You know, so your perspective changes. You know, the way you look at people, the way you look at challenges, the way you look at God changes. You know, you, he's not waiting with like a school teacher with a, you know, with a with a ruler to beat you. You know, he's not waiting angrily. No, he's looking at us with, uh, you know, eyes of eyes of love. Uh, he loves us so much, and uh, not with condemnation but uh, really justification. He has justified us and he sees us as the righteousness of God. So, so the word of God shows us how God sees us. But the important thing is we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. I hope that helps Priya. Okay, right. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so we are back to, you know, um, the first voice is God's voice, which means God, you know, we, we pray, we ask him, he speaks. And uh, many times our own reasoning of fear, we, we sometimes, uh, I mean, many times we actually overrule that and we say, no, it cannot be. It's just my, you know, my imagination. Um, but how will you know unless you test out, unless, unless you walk it out? And um, yeah, and then you, you'll be pleasantly surprised, right? There are many instances and probably I'll just share a few of them later, um, you know, in one of the other classes that you know, I was so surprised, so taken aback uh, when, you know, when I stepped out and shared what God put in my heart. And I was just wondering, you know, if I had not shared, I would have missed that opportunity, you know. Uh, and many times had happened where I had not shared. I was so fearful and, uh, you know, not shared. And I thought, okay, uh, I feel uncomfortable talking about this. And, and I was just, you know, those are moments that, that have gone. Of course, God will reach out in different ways to the people, but then, you know, I can't do anything about it. So that's fine. But the thing is, uh, you you are now, you know, a little more sensitive and say, okay, God speaks. It's okay. 
to sound foolish, it's okay to step out and you know uh, look a little stupid in front of people. But then you realize that, uh, like I said, you know, 99% of the time, you realize that you will be pleasantly surprised when you uh, and, and shocked at times at the accuracy with which God conveys that information. It just needs that step of faith uh, to share that, right? Okay, okay, so. We need to get out of our mind to flow with the spirit. So, so the thing is that you know we need to understand first of all that our mind has been created by God. Okay, God has created a spirit, soul, and body. Okay, so He's got, created us with a spirit that can communicate to Him, relate to Him, uh, spend eternity with Him, and etc. Uh, he's created us with the the soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, our imaginations, uh, etc. He's created. He's created with with a body, so that we can relate to things physically on this earth and and so on. So he is he has created us. So it's not like we negate or you know just completely block out using our mind. Okay, so that is never the case. It's just that we need to renew our mind to the Word of God, to His thinking. Like align our minds, our, our thinking to his way of thinking, his will, his ways, right? Our, our mind needs to be renewed. So then it's a very powerful uh, tool, right, to receive the word of God. Uh, but the unrenewed mind blocks out, unrenewed mind cancels out the instruction that comes from God. So we're not saying, you know, advocating uh, the lack of reason or that. It's just that it needs to be renewed okay so the thing is there are certain things that will go beyond logic you know for example when you look at philip okay philip is uh, philip is having a we read about philip in acts chapter 7 or 8 um uh, acts chapter 8 okay so we read about philip he's there in samaria he's uh, he's preaching the he's preached the gospel uh, a lot of people are coming to know the lord there's a lot of there's a there's a revival you know he's talking about this entire uh, uh, region which is coming to know the gospel. There's revival. There's uh, wonderful things happening, and uh, it says in verse um, where is this? Ah, verse twenty six. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, "Arise and go towards the south along the road which is uh, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza," and uh, you know. The description is that it's a, it's a deserted place or it's it's desert. So, see, there's wonderful things happening here, and then the angel, through the, God's word comes through this through this angel. Um, go, leave this place. Okay, so it seems illogical, you know. I need to be here, pastor this whole thing. This work is there, um, but he he obeys. Okay, like I'm sure people would would be would have said, you know. Uh, Pastor Philip, you need to be here. You know why? Why are you leaving? It's a, a great time of outpouring. It's a great revival that's happening. Uh, we need your leadership. Yes, Peter and John came and prayed, and you know we're all filled with the Spirit. But uh, you know we need you. You came and you started the work here. We need you to be here and stay here and so on. But he obeyed the voice of the uh, voice of God. Right? He obeyed the word of God came through the angel of the Lord and he obeyed. And because of that obedience, we see that uh, the nation of Ethiopia receiving the gospel. The official comes there, he is saved, and he takes the gospel um, back to his nation. Right? He goes there as a saved, baptized believer. Um, and, and so we read them. That's right? So sometimes the instruction seems to like not go without thinking. Right? So that is what you know, we we need to understand that when we test, when we know that this is it is the word of God, it is the voice of God, it is the leading of the Spirit. Just obey, right? So, what happens when we are unsure? Okay, we can always get confirmation. We can get it validated, right? We can ask people, and uh, we can you know we can get the thing validated. You know, whatever we are, the leading that we are getting, we can. Well, people, God will confirm. You know, it's not like he's, uh, you know, he's said something and he's not going to um, confirm it in any way or give more information about it. 
right? So, uh, you know, he will speak, he will validate it in different ways. Like he might give us a whole sense of peace and uh, a very strong sense of, um, you know, uh, leading to do that uh, and so on, right? Okay. Um, okay, so I'll just move on to uh, about the gifts of the spirit. Uh, for the purpose of learning, you know, these nine gifts, which we listed, um, just categorizing these as vocal gifts, revelation gifts, and power gifts. Okay, vocal, revelation, power. Vocal gifts, gifts that say something. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. Okay, uh, revelation gifts, gifts that reveal something. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. And then power gifts, gifts that do something. Gifts of healings, uh, working of miracles, and faith. Okay, so all these nine gifts, three each in each of these categories. And it's for the purpose of learning only, uh, so that we remember. Uh, and it's it's not for any other purpose. You know, we can't really put them in a box because it's just uh, like we saw, you know, it, it, it gives it gives flow together. You know, they could be a word of wisdom for uh, or the word of knowledge followed by, you know, gifts of healings and so on. Okay, so okay, let's look at uh, gift of tongues. Okay, we, we looked at that, we studied that earlier, but we're just going to quickly go through that. So uh, a kind of a refresher also, right? So um, there are different kinds of tongues, right? And uh, we see that it's a tongue is given as a prayer language for the edification of the believer. Okay, where do we, where do we, where did we see that? Uh, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, talks about the fact that um, the tongues, when we pray in tongues, we are edified. Okay, um, it can be as a, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 14 and uh, uh, verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Okay. Uh, now, tongues can be a, in deep intercession for others also, right? It can be tongues for intercession. Um, so, um, like we see um, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28 onwards, it, it talks about uh, you know, varieties of tongues. And um, uh, so tongues can be, since it's a prayer language, it can be interceding for others also. And we also see in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, that sometimes we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Romans 8 verse 26, but the Holy Spirit helps us. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, so it can be a, it's a prayer language. It's an intercessory prayer language as well. Now, uh, it can be a message with an interpretation, right? So maybe in church, praying, and then there is this message in tongues. And it, uh, along with that comes an interpretation. Uh, so it can, be an inter uh, it can be a message with interpretation, or it can be a sign to, uh, it can be a sign for the unbeliever. Okay, uh, like we saw in Acts chapter 2. What happened? People were, were praising God in earthly languages and uh, the, those who heard uh, recognized it as their own mother tongue and they were drawn to it because they were surprised. How can these people know my language? These are Jews, these are Galileans. How can they know my language? And they were drawn to it. Right, so it can be a sign to the unbeliever. So, um, so we see that okay, we, uh, it's not something that the language that you learned. Okay. So, does the Old Testament talk about it? Okay, the Old Testament, uh, well, there are some indirect references. One of the things that we see is in Genesis 11 when you know when there was uh, different languages, okay, different languages being released on the earth at the Tower of Babel. Okay, we see that, um, but we also see some indirect references um, where Isaiah 28, okay, Isaiah 28, and uh, uh, maybe we can uh, look at that verse. Okay, Isaiah 28 and verse 11. Okay, for with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to his people, um, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Okay, and Paul um, refers to this um, uh, to this prophecy in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 and verse 21. Okay, um, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 21. 
Um, let's read that also. It says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear. So again, you know, he's talking about tongues. And, and then he goes on to say, verse 22, therefore tongues are for a sign, and so on. So we see that uh, these references are there in the Old Testament. Okay? So when we come to the New Testament, when we come to um, uh, the Gospels, we see that the Lord Jesus actually foretold this. Okay, um, The Lord Jesus um, uh, talks about this, and uh, we see this in, in the uh, uh, in when he commissions the, uh, his disciples in Mark chapter 16, right? Um, okay, let's um, let's read there. Mark chapter 16 and uh, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Okay. So we see that the Lord Jesus actually uh, foretold that this would happen to the believers, to the, the believers of the Lord. The, these uh, would happen to his disciples, that they would speak with new tongues. They would cast out demons. They would speak with new tongues. Okay, and um, and like we studied in the book of Acts, we see several instances where people spoke in tongues. And you know, like we um, saw, there were at least thrice, you know, three times out of those five instances when which we studied about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, where people spoke in tongues. Okay, it was accompanied by people speaking in tongues, other tongues. We we see that very clearly. And the other two times, that is um, in Samaria, where Philip Philip was ministering, and also in um, uh, uh, when it came to uh, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, when Ananias prayed over him, it says he was baptized, but we don't read whether there was tongues. But then we see that eventually there was something happening, uh, because Paul uh, was filled with the Spirit, and then he... He spoke in tongues a lot, and he testified, saying, "You know, I pray in tongues more than you all." Okay, so we we saw we see all these uh, instances of uh, praying praying in tongues, and by looking at uh, the lives of the apostles and the ministry of the apostles, we know that this is something that was um, that was um, that was taught, that was preached, that there, this was something that people were prayed for. Right. Uh, to receive as well. Um, Peter and John, when they came to Samaria, they prayed that they might people might receive the Holy Spirit and they ended up, you know, there's something supernatural happening. Paul, when he asked the believers in Ephesus, right, we see in, uh, uh, is it Acts 19? Um, right, we see that um, uh, he, the first question he asked is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you prayed? And then they he prays over them, and they they also prayed in tongues and prophesied. So you see that this is this is what the ministry was right in the early church. They shared the gospel. They were baptized in water. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, and this is how it happened. So we see these right through um, the, the the book of Acts. We see in the epistles as well, and of course. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, we see a very detailed explanation of what they should do, how um, tongues must be employed in the church, uh, how it should not, and and you know that the fact is it's for the building up of the of the individual uh, and or the body of Christ. You know when he's talking about the gifts and, and so on. So you realize that yes, Paul would have taught it. Paul would have prayed for the people, for them to receive, and here he's giving instruction, more instruction on how they should uh, they should walk in it, and continue to walk in it, uh, in a manner that glorifies the Lord, and in a manner that is out of love, like love for God, love for people. So he shares about that. You know, you do this in love. Like if you prophesy and you have not love, if I pray in tongues, if I don't have love, what does it profit? Right? It's it's nothing. So he talks about that as well. So we know that this is something which was prevalent. It's not something that stopped 
but something that was actually prevalent in the church. Okay, um, Jude also, right? Um, uh, Jude verse twenty says um, uh, it talks about that. Um, that uh, Jude twenty. Let me just quickly. Uh, yeah, Jude twenty. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we we see the this also. Uh, Jude also writing. Okay. Okay, so we see that there are varieties of uses or varieties of benefits when it comes to praying in tongues. Okay, so let's let's look at some of them. Okay, what happens when we pray in tongues? Okay, when we uh, first of all we need to understand that all believers can. Okay, now when we make that statement, all believers can pray in tongues. It means that potentially every believer can. Okay, every believer. Uh, actually can pray in tongues. But do all believers pray in tongues? Well, we know the answer is no, okay, for various reasons. And personally, I can testify that uh, from the time I accepted the Lord till the time I actually started praying in tongues, it was actually about eight years, right? And uh, and the reason uh, why eight years, uh, lack of teaching, lack of understanding, um, that was the main thing and lack of desire on my part as well because there was no teaching and there was no uh, uh, you know understanding it in the right manner so about eight years had passed where uh, it, so it was not like the you know the, the believers at Cornelius' house where he preached and of course we see that it was a sovereign you know outpouring of the spirit and it happened and, and of course they were living in a very unusual time of you know great outpouring of the spirit right uh, we see that right so, well, uh, so there was no teaching like the Corinthian church, right, where Paul would have taught about that. And so there was no teaching. So for me, it was eight years. So as a believer, could I speak, right, right from the day one when I became a believer? Yes. Did I speak? Did I pray in tongues? No. Uh, did I eventually end up praying in tongues? Yes. Praise God for that. Praise God for people who, you know, had the courage to come and teach, um, uh, even though they knew that I was from a very, very traditional church background, they said, okay, I need to teach these guys, you know, and then they taught and, and they ended up, you know, uh, being filled with spirit and praying in tongues, right? Okay, so when you pray in tongues, what happens? Okay, we, first of all, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 11 says um, that they were talking they were praising god they were talking or declaring the wonderful works of god okay so um acts chapter 2 verse 11 Cretans and arab we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of god um again when we turn to acts chapter 10 um uh, acts chapter 10 and verse 46 Okay, this is Cornelius' house. And uh, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So you're magnifying God, praising God, declaring the wonderful works of God when you pray in tongues. So is it a good thing? Of course. Right? We magnify, we, we uh, uh, talk about the wonderful uh, works of God. Okay, so um, 1 Corinthians 12 Again, when we go there and verses 7 to 11 talks about the fact that, uh, um, just let me just get there. The power of God being manifest. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Um, sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 12 and verse 7. Okay, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So this is the display of the Spirit. And then this display of the Spirit, this or expression of the Spirit, is in all these ways, word of wisdom. So we see the power gifts, we see the revelatory gifts, we see the vocal gifts being released. And it is a expression of the, uh, of the Spirit of God. So we see that the presence of God, the power of God, right? the vocal gifts, the revelatory gifts, um, the power gifts, being an expression of God Himself, right? being an expression of the Spirit of God, being an expression. So when you say an expression of God, it is an expression of His presence. 
it is obviously an expression of his power it's an expression of his love his compassion everything right so it's an expression of the presence and power of god and uh, praying in tongues is is one one of those uh, expressions right uh, we need to understand that when we pray in tongues we could be speaking in a earthly language or it could be a heavenly language okay so why do we say that acts chapter 2 we see that people spoke in earthly language uh, 1 corinthians 13 and verse 1 says do i speak with tongues of men and of angels um, but ha- not have love i have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal so he is saying you know i could speak which means he's saying you know i could speak with tongues of men or languages of men or languages of uh angels meaning it could be an earthly language it could be a heavenly language earthly languages or heavenly language right so um it it could be that so when we pray in tongues it is that okay so when we so the question you know some some people ask okay uh it seems like gibberish or it doesn't seem like a language possibly right it could be maybe just a, a few syllables of a heavenly language or a few syllables of earthly language which a person is you know uttering praying out um but that is that is what it is right so it could be earthly it could be heavenly it could be a few words it could be a few syllables that we are uttering out we are declaring okay um praying in tongues helps in praying mysteries things beyond what you know personally what we personally know okay so we see that 1 corinthians 14 in verse 2 uh, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god for no one understands him however in the spirit he speaks mysteries okay so what are these mysteries these could be uh, these are you know uh, things that are hidden yet to be revealed okay uh, yet to be revealed to us personally uh, maybe it's about what god has in store for us in the future maybe it's about the course of direction that he wants us to take maybe it's about uh, you know something uh, uh, i mean uh, a deeper understanding of the word uh, it could be several things right things that are hidden waiting to be revealed not hidden you know and just need to be hidden through the ages no these are these are the mysteries so he who prays in a tongue speaks mysteries now he doesn't have to speak mysteries to to god right he speak, speaks the mysteries to his you know to his own spirit and um, the thing is the revelation of those mysteries and so um because god god knows all things right there's nothing hidden f- uh, from him or there's nothing hidden for him but these are mysteries which are hidden for the believer to be revealed to be unearthed and uh, you know uh, ephesians also talks about that that we will discover okay uh, let's look at that i'll just quickly make a reference of that verse um ephesians 2 and verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them okay so, so these good works now i need to discover i need to walk in it that god will uncover it and and praying in tongues helps towards that right so we speak mysteries things beyond what we personally what we personally know okay tongues also bring in personal edification where we are built up in the spirit we are refreshed we are built up there is a strengthening that is happening right so um, tongues help in that it's like you know physically you go to a gym you work out you're building strength you're building stamina and and all that happens right so spiritually you know this is what happens when we pray in tongues where we are being built up in the inner man we are strong made strong in the spirit okay um so you see you know this the scope of praying in tongues and uh, you know no wonder there's so much misunderstanding no wonder you know the, sometimes the you know the devil just fights brings so much of confusion about this one thing it's a wonderful gift right it's it's for the benefit of the believer it's for the edification of the believer okay so um tongues when it is interpreted 
to the congregation you know if it is a message in tongues when there is interpretation of tongues it brings edification to the to the congregation right so uh, that is what he says and he who prophesies in is indeed greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification so when there is a message in tongues when there's edif- when there's interpretation then there is edification so tongues with interpretation to the church brings edification tongues maybe there's no interpretation but to me to us personally when we when we continue to pray there is always edification okay um then we see that uh, when we pray in tongues our spirit is praying our mind is not involved okay so uh, understanding paul says my understanding is unfruitful okay verse 14 1 corinthians 14 and verse 14 for if i pray in a tongue my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful what does that mean that means that i don't understand what i'm praying right this is paul um writing these words to the church and he's saying this is what happens so don't um so when we read it and we say okay if you have questions okay i don't understand should i really continue on it oh yes because it's it's something that is scriptural your understanding is unfruitful your spirit prays but your understanding is unfruitful so but don't worry about it continue in faith persist in faith because it is bringing in edification okay okay so um it can be done at our own will in the sense you know many people have questions you know when can i pray in tongues you know uh, uh, when is when does uh, it happen you know can i pray whenever i want to can i stop whenever i want to um of course right so uh, it says um, um uh, uh, verse 15 1 corinthians 14 and verse 15 what is the conclusion then paul says i will pray with the spirit and i will also pray with the understanding okay so here i uh, just want to talk about uh, i think we looked at it earlier but just wanted to mention that whenever we see the phrase pray with the spirit okay uh, or pray in the spirit right um the uh, when we when we encounter these phrases it is about praying in tongues right how do we know that well in that same scripture here where he's paul is contrasting between praying with the understanding like right? praying in a known language i pray with the understanding and he's contrasting that with praying in tongues which is praying with the spirit okay let's read verse 15 chapter 14 verse 15 1 corinthians what is the conclusion then i will pray with the spirit and i will also pray with the understanding Okay, so he's making those two distinctions and he's saying i'll do both i'll pray with the spirit i will also pray with the understanding then he also says i will sing with the spirit and i will also sing with the understanding so meaning that you can also sing in tongues you can also sing with the understanding okay so that's something that we see um well uh, the other thing is we can ask the holy spirit or i want to pray about this i want to pray about this decision that is in front of me what i can't choose whether it's a b or c or d or what should i choose i don't know or so help me and you spend that time praying in tongues okay so what is what is happening you know romans 8 and verse 26 we saw that holy spirit helps us um sometimes we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to pray right i don't know whether i you know lord whether it's a or b or c or d uh, i don't know whether even to pray about those things you know of those options before me pray in the spirit pray in tongues right so um paul writes and he says you know if you bless with the spirit okay so how will he who occupies the place of this uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks in his, since he does not understand what you say so um if you you for you indeed give thanks well but the other is not edified so what is he saying you know is in the context of a meal when you're praying even there you know you're praying in tongues um but the person who 
um, you know, maybe if it's in a group, he cannot understand. So how will he say, agree and say, so be it, right? So that's the thing. But then you understand that for various things, you can pray in tongues. You can, you know, ask, ask the Lord to direct your prayer and, and say, Lord, I'm praying about this and I'm going to be praying in tongues for this particular matter. And I'm going to pray in tongues for, you know, this season, uh, right? Um, okay, we looked at that tongues um how it can be a uh, it can be the refreshing isaiah 28 verse 12 and paul referring to that um so a place of quietness peace stillness comfort okay the, the word rest in the hebrew so this is the rest this is the refreshing so um, you know tongues brings about that to in the life of a believer okay tongues can be a sign to the unbeliever as well we saw that uh, tongues can help us overcome the weakness of the flesh. Um, we make intercession for the saints of God when we uh, pray in tongues. Uh, we pray according to the will of God when we pray in tongues. Uh, we build ourselves in faith when we pray in tongues. Um, we stay in the love of God when we pray in tongues. You know, when we look at the armor of God, I'm so I'm sure you've read that many times. Ephesians six. Uh, where every piece of the armor is uh, is uh, very um, you know in detail, it's it's given right. So it says, "Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God." And then we go down to uh, verse uh, eighteen. It says, um, "Praying always uh, with all sorry, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit." Right. So, as part of the armor, as part of the weapon, he's, he's talk, talked about all the pieces of the armor. And then he says, praying uh, always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given. But then he makes the thing, you know, you pray in the spirit as intercession, you pray in the spirit. As uh, you know, praying for supplication, which is petition, petitioning God, you pray in the spirit, right? So it's it's not only is it part of the spiritual armor, but you know you pray, intercede, you petition in the spirit when you pray in tongues, right? So uh, I'm sorry. There's another book uh, which uh, which is also uh, something that I've uploaded in the stream, which you can download and use, um, which is praying in tongues. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so we looked at all this. Uh, when it comes to tongues, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this and then uh, public tongues in public ministry. Can can we pray in tongues in public? Okay, um, so uh, we saw very we we see very clearly in one Corinthians we see that um, yes you can. Okay, um, but if it if it's going to be a message in tongues, then it needs to be interpreted. Okay, so one Corinthians fourteen. Okay, so this is what uh, we see here uh, in verse five. He very clearly says that unless he interprets, the church is not edified. Okay, so if it's in a church, if it's in a fellowship, it's in a gathering, uh, maybe a Bible study, whatever. If you're going to be praying tongues out loud to the people, let there be interpretation. Okay. If there is no interpretation, then there is no edification. People are not edified. You might be edified. People are not. Okay. Uh, verse 12, uh, he's saying, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So which means that, uh, you know, let this public praying in tongues, if there is no edification, I mean, if there is no interpretation, do not venture into it. Um, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Okay. And in verse 13, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Okay. So if, you, if there is, if you feel compelled to pray out loud, you know, as a message in tongues, pray that you may interpret as well. Okay. Then, does that mean that I should not pray in tongues at all? If I'm in a church, right? If I'm in a church setting, worship, can I pray out loud in tongues? Well, 
this is what we see right um verse 27 again if anyone speaks in a tongue let there be two or at the most three each in turn and let one interpret okay then he says but if there is no interpreter verse 28 1 Corinthians 14 verse 28 but if there is no interpreter let him keep silent in church okay and then he goes on to explain how does this person keep silent in church it is not that that person is not going to pray in tongues at all which is interesting you know, many times we come to that conclusion tongues in church no tongues now, that's the conclusion that we come to. But then that's not what he says. He says, if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, you see that? So that's the that's the full verse. That's the full instruction. So you keep silent in church, meaning you don't speak to, you don't address the crowd in tongues, but you speak to yourself and to God. You continue to speak to God. You know, can you hear yourself speak to God? Can God hear you? You know, you speak to God. You engage with God. You continue to pray in tongues so that you are edified. You do that. As long as there is an interpretation, you continue to do that. And this all this is how it ends. Verse 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Okay, so, uh, and then he says, let all things be done decently and in order. So mainly about prophecy and tongues, you know, a lot of these instructions, but this is what he says, do not forbid to speak in tongues. So which means when, I, when, when, we, when we see that verse, let him keep silent in church, it means that I can pray in tongues um, to, you know, I pray in tongues between myself and God. Okay, so that is what we see here. Um, okay, uh, so I'll stop here. I think we've gone beyond uh, 50. We'll stop here and just want to encourage you, encourage all of us to continue to uh, pray in tongues. Uh, if, you've, uh, uh, if you have not yet started praying in tongues, I want to encourage you, you know, to, uh, to begin to do that. Okay, uh, and uh, the instructions like we uh, you can you can actually go through um, the, the the book that we uh, that we are using that has a prayer that has instructions just between you and God and say come Holy Spirit fill me I I know this is for me this is what your word says so I want to begin to uh, you know pray in this so help me and you begin to speak out. You begin to speak out in faith the words, the syllables that the Spirit puts in your heart, and you speak it out. Okay? Okay. God bless. Uh, we'll meet again next week. See you all. Bye-bye.